Hello and welcome into the Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Drew of Big Ten Network, and this week's guests are Denver Broncos, former Penn State star wide receiver KJ Hamler, and Big Ten Network Manager of Research Harold Shelton. Let's get into it. Take a look, listen, and enjoy. Look at here, look at here. With the catch, the finish! Oh! All right, before we get to KJ Hamler, real quick, a word from our sponsor, the Northwestern University School of Professional Studies. You can build a solid foundation in the strategic, creative, and analytic skills that are essential for success in the business of sports in the master's program in sports administration at Northwestern University. Find out more at sbs.northwestern.edu slash sports. Great opportunity there for anyone who wants to get into the business of sports, work at a place potentially like Big Ten Network, Check it out. Thanks, as always, to our sponsor up in Evanston at Northwestern. All right, let's get now to our interview with KJ Hamler. Really, really fun discussion with him. Had a blast. Um, super energetic, engaging dude. I'm sure Penn State fans are familiar with that personality, but talks a lot about his first year in the NFL. Um, Share some insight, some really you know, funny anecdotes, and uh, I'll let him take it away now. It's our interview with KJ Hamler, Penn State and Broncos wide receiver. I'm very pleased to be joined by a former Penn State star, current Denver Broncos wide receiver. It is KJ Hamler. KJ, what's up, man? How are you? What's up? How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm doing great. Doing great. Um, you know, I saw you're in Florida training right now, just living that off-season life. So what's that lifestyle like, you know, being a pro, kind of your first real off-season, you know, COVID stuff aside, just getting one year under your belt? Um, You know, just... I'm not, you know, this is all all something new to me. So just figuring out how to train, you know, what's the perfect time to start training and stuff like that was probably the most uh, difficult for me because um, I didn't know when to stop. You know, I didn't know when to give my body a rest, really. So I was always working out or doing something. Um, so just getting that in the mindset of, you know, how to train like a pro, how to, you know, train in the off offseason. Um, but it really helps. So I'm down at Exos in Pensacola right now. Um, I'm here with a couple of vets that have been in the league four, five, six years. So they actually, you know, really helped me, um, guide me throughout the process and things of that nature. So I've been learning from them guys a lot. So offseason has been going pretty good, though. Yeah, and just came off a year with the Denver Broncos, uh, second-round mm-hmm. pick. You know, obviously we know what you did at Penn State. Uh, what was your, if there was one, what was your, like, welcome to the NFL moment? Like, all right, this is a, this is a little different at this level. I know, you know, with COVID there might not have been, like, the rookie shows or the, the – uh, you know, the teasing that the rookies get buying dinner for the vets. Right. But uh, what was maybe one of those moments for you? Man, I think uh, the moment for me was probably first game versus the Raiders. And uh, I ran a post down the middle. And, you know, he threw it and I just got flipped. Landed right on my neck. I'm like, yeah. I had to walk it off. You know, you have to play. You got to play tough guy. But it hurt. It did hurt. But now I think that was kind of like my welcome to NFL moment. Or um, Do you remember who I I think I don't know. I know I know Jeff Heath caught the interception though, but um, I don't know who flipped me. It was it just happened so fast. Um, or it was when we played the Falcons and I ran a slant across the middle, and Keanu O'Neill was just waiting for me right there and just lit me up. I'm like, oh man. So I felt you know both of them two hits. Probably I was yeah. It was like a welcome to NFL right there. <laughs> love it, love it. Uh, you know you got going really got going in the second half of the season. Uh, you know, a couple touchdowns week 14. You had six for 75 in week nine, that game-winning catch against, uh, I believe it was the Chargers in week eight. So was that just yep. like a, a comfort thing, settling in? Was it getting back from that hamstring injury? Why, why do you think the second half really took off uh, for you in your rookie season? Um, I think, you know, the second half took off just because, you know, I started to get more comfortable. Um, I started to understand the game and, uh, you know, just more film study and stuff of that nature. You know, when it comes to those things, you know, because I know a lot of guys who, you know, study film. I'm like, why do you study film so much? You know, and it's just because they're smart. Like, I, I had to learn that in the league. Like, a lot of guys are way smarter than in college. You know, no disrespect to anybody in college. But, you know, you got 
10, 11 year vets out there on defense and they, they're, you know, in the exact spot that you need to be at the right moment, you know, because that just takes place on film study, knowing tendencies and stuff like that. So I didn't truly understand that to like the second half of the season, you know, and I'm always asked questions to, you know, people on our defense, you know, the older guys, just to understand their point of view and their ways of why they do this. You know, why are they in this alignment, things of that nature. So just trying to learn from all the older guys and it really helps, you know, I, I even watch, like a lot of times I like to watch the D-line and do their little drills just because a lot of stuff correlates to different positions. Like D-line use their hands. That's kind of similar to receivers using release. So I try to, you know, correlate my game and just learn from every little bit and piece from, you know, everybody on the team. Yeah, I never really thought about that, how, how D-line and yeah. hand work is, is similar. Uh, and, yeah. you know, so, someone slept on you in my fantasy league and traded you to, to my team. So I was happy mm-hmm. to pick you up in the second half of the year, you know, got you hey. – a value deal so uh that just shows who real and who ain't that just shows who real and who ain't <laughs> exactly you know you know um also speaking of like linemen and and uh i've heard some funny stories in the past about like linemen having weird pregame rituals i don't know if you have any pregame rituals but what's what's either the weirdest one that you have or the weirdest one you've seen in football locker rooms Ooh, i don't know i think i think the the smelling salt I think, you know, a lot of linemen, and it, you know, they just, they wake them up. I'm like, I'm like, what's that? And I'm like, I want to try that. And then it just, I did it for the first time. And I was like, it just burnt my whole face. I'm like, oh man. But I started to do it a lot. You know, it kind of wakes you up, you know, especially when you don't have um, fans, you know, it was kind of hard dealing with no fans. I'm coming from 110,000 fans to zero. So it was just, you know, you got to get your juices flowing. Um, so the smell of salts really, really woke you up for the game. <laughs> I feel like that's like a, that's an old school like uh, yeah song that's just lasted throughout the years. That's that's yeah. We got we got a lot of guys on the team that do that, especially Lam, especially Lam. That wakes them up. All right, so this type of uh, this time of year, you know, it's it's combine season, pro day season. No NFL mm-hmm. combine this year, but it's spread out. We're seeing a lot of numbers come in. Uh, I know you know you had the the hamstring issue last year, but I did see when I Googled, you had a four point two seven forty time. Um, which is obviously ridiculous. I think we saw Rondell Moore had like four two nine yesterday. Have you ever like not been the fastest player on any field you stepped on? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. It, except when we played the Chiefs, and I, I really seen Tyreek Hill run in real life. I'm like, I'm a little bit taller than him though, so like my legs are longer. You know, I think everybody's built different. Like his legs just move so fast, but I can stride. You know, it's, it's very different, but um, I don't think I've not been the fastest on the field, you know. Um, yeah, that's actually a tough one. I don't think I haven't, though. It's been the first. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think so. Not at all. Yeah, Tyreek Hill, I, I guess that would be the one guy who could maybe, maybe match that, that quickness. But, yeah, his, uh, his, leg, his legs move so fast. It's just ridiculous. Well, you know, Big Ten kind of got the last laugh with Antoine Winfield with the uh, at the end of the Super Bowl there, you know? Uh, yeah, that's my guy. I, tell, I hit him up after that. I'm like, man, congrats, my guy. Because I just remember playing him in Minnesota. I, oh, I'm still hurt about that game. He was a dog, Minnesota. man. Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. We give credit. Got to give credit to him. Got to yeah, give credit. Was crazy. That was Minnesota's, like, come-up game at, uh, at home for them. Yeah. Um, all right, so also I was, I was checking out your social media and, you know, saw some clips of you playing db a couple weeks back i think probably where you were training down in florida yeah Um, yeah. so say you line up a db right uh in some weird circumstance how many picks do you think you'd have in a full season if you had to to fill in a db uh over 16 games Ooh, be realistic let me be realistic i don't think nobody's gonna throw to my side that's the that's that's like the hard part, you know. I still got it because DB was my first position. That was my first love for receivers. I really chose to play receiver because I like getting in the end zone. Like that's just a thing for me. Uh, I don't, I think a lot of DBs don't get the credit they deserve nowadays, you know, because um, there's a lot of good DBs out there, and a lot of them don't get, you know, the credit they deserve. And um, you know, I kind of I just I went out there and I seen like the guys that trained for combine, uh, all the DBs that trained for the combine. I'm like, let me let me work out with y'all today. Just see if I still got it. And um, <laughs> I did it. And I was like, oh, I feel kind of good. You know, I feel kind of good doing all that stuff. But if I was saying the season, I'd probably say six or seven. Six or seven. John, 
Do John Elway know this though? That like you got this in your bag? He don't know. I don't think he knows. But coach, uh, my the DB coach last year, Coach Ronaldo Hill, he recruited me at Pitt. Um, he wanted me to come to Pitt and play both ways. So he was my DB coach for the Broncos last year. So yeah, I remember when you know all the DBs kind of went down. You know, um, we had a lot of injuries to the to the DB room, and he was like, "Hey, you know, you know you the reserve." I was like, "Coach, you already know. I know. I've been doing this for a while. I know." So. Uh, he always had that in the back of his head. I don't know if he was serious or not, but I always wanted to play DB. You guys, Coach Franklin. I said, I, I text, I text Coach Franklin the videos too. I was like, ah, should have put me in on the third down packages, you know, just joking around with him. <laughs> so that goes into my next question. Like if you could pick one, let's say one Penn State wide receiver ever to lock up, uh, put the clamps on a DB or, and then beyond that one uh, player in the league today, one NFL player on any team. So one Penn State and then one NFL receiver. One Penn State, got to be my boy, Deshaun Hamilton. Or Jahan, because Jahan does some talk crazy. He thinks, Jahan, uh, I'm, I'm strapping Jahan. And, and you can you can tag Penn State on this, too, because he knows. He knows I'm his big brother. So, I'm yeah, I'm really on him like that. <laughs> but Deshaun, yeah, I'm going to have to go with Deshaun, too. So, it's out of Deshaun, Jahan. And then in the league, hmm, that's a tough one. I would say... I want to see how D Hop is because he just makes acrobatic catches that's out of this world. You know, like it, it, I've seen so many clips of DBs being in such great position and he just making a catch. Like it's ridiculous. So it was like, I think he's probably one of the hardest guys to guard because a DB can have such great position on him, hand in his face and all. And he just comes down with it. So I think D Hop, D Hop. He's the one that broke, was it D'Angelo Hall on Hard Knocks? Did you see that clip? Yep. Yep, yep. That remains one of the best hard knocks clips I've ever seen. Just, just no, that's for sure. Yeah, that is for sure. All right, man. Uh, speaking of Penn State, uh, some of your guys you just mentioned there, I do want to get into some some Penn State talk. Uh, you mm-hmm. guys like I've had a now that I think about it, I had a bunch of Penn State guys on the show. Uh, Allen Robinson, Trace, guys like that, and you guys seem mm-hmm. to like stay, you know, really connected as teammates and as alumni. You know, you always gassing these guys up on social media, and that seems like across the board um, among all those former Penn State guys. So why do you think those things are so tight with with that group of uh, alums? I think that, you know, we bonded so well in the locker room, like outside of football. It was um, it was just like a family atmosphere. What's up, Pop? That's fine. Cool. Dad just came in from a workout. You know, he working just like me. I got you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that, you know, our bond was so – so strong you know you know I was coming in as a freshman so I was a freshman but I always you know I always hung out with the older guys I was always with Trace you know um Marcus Allen you know um Amani you know all those guys Saquon you know I was always with those guys you know just trying to pick their brain and learn from them why they do the stuff they do what they do outside of football you know and I felt like a lot of times they didn't look at us as oh we're just the young kids you know we're just freshmen you know they actually hung out with us and I was pretty cool. You know, you don't find a lot of older guys doing that for freshmen, you know, and they kind of took us under their wing. So I think, you know, me personally, I still keep in touch with all those guys. Um, but I think it's just because of the bond we had outside of football. You know, a lot of I don't think a lot of teams have that. That's what really builds the team, um, just to trust each other, you know, um, build with one another. So I think that was the main, main part of us, you know, still keeping in contact, still – retweeting his tweet, you know, supporting him. We're always going to support each other regardless, just because, not just because we went to the same school, but just because we consider each other family. Yeah, and you went to the same <laughs> same high school as Allen Robinson, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. me and A-Rob went to the same high school. Yeah, and I'm doubting outside of, like, you know, anywhere outside of, like, IMG, which I know I think you went to after, uh, mm-hmm. after Michigan, uh, your high school in Michigan. Outside of, like, those big prep schools, I doubt any high school in the country has two current, you know, NFL receivers like that coming out of it. And I know... You're a few years younger, but what was it like kind of following A-Rob in, in those uh, high school footsteps, especially coming up, you know, 14, 15 years old? Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of crazy because, you know, I remember A-Rob came up to my school in Michigan one time. I was I think I was a sophomore or junior. And, you know, he worked out with us one time. And it was just crazy um, just seeing a guy of that caliber and, you know, just being around him, just knowing he went to the same school you did. And then I ended up going to Penn State. Um so it was like we both went to the same, you know, high school and college. 
uh, it'd be crazy if we end up playing together one day. That'd be the craziest thing. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, we always looked up to him. I think a lot of us, you know, that went to St. Mary's looked up to him because he was like the main guy doing, you know, big things. So, you know, when he came up to school and he talked to us, you know, gave us advice, you know, I think we all appreciated that, you know. Um, I still keep in contact with him a little bit to this day, uh, but I know he's a busy man, so I don't bother him that much. Yeah, I mean, I'm a Bears fan, and and they're doing my man wrong, but, you know, we won't even get into that. Well, yeah, I, we won't got to get into that. Yeah, we got to get into that. He, you know, he's been on the show, like I said, super nice guy, comes by our studio sometimes, and love Allen Robinson. Um, all right, thinking back to your Penn State days, um, mm-hmm. play I remember the most from you is kind of mostly because I was at this game when you guys were playing Maryland. They had, like, the blackout Friday night uh, oh, yep. and sellout. Gotcha. Yeah, you were in the all-white. You, you know, catch the ball on the open field and break this dude down uh, in the secondary. I think spin him around, you know, embarrass somebody. Where does that play rank among your favorite plays in your Penn State career? And are there any that top it? Because for me, that's the one that I just remember being like, wow. Like, first of all, this dude silenced 50,000 people, and it was just a, a dirty move. I think I think that's is for sure one of my top five plays. I don't think it's number one. I think number one is the Ohio State slant 2018 night three yarder. That got to be number one. Because that one, that play right there, I think really put my name on the map after that. Um, I went for, I think I went for four catches, like 150 that game, one touch. Um, and then I didn't finish the game. I got, that's why I got knocked out. I was asleep on the field. So I'm still disappointed about that. Um, and then I think the next one would be my kick return versus Michigan that got called back. That was, oh, uh, that was heartbreaking. That was my first kick return of my career. And it was so smooth. Just the lane was just so open. And, you know, I think that was my second. My third would probably be the post from Michigan, 2019. And then my fourth would probably be that slant from Maryland that I broke guy, that I broke that guy down. So um, at the end of the day, it's playing football. You know, I was really just having fun. Um, like, you don't realize what you do until you do it. You know what I mean? Like, you just – you kind of, I kind of look back at the old highlights, like, man, I can't believe I did that, you know. So um, just trying to, you know, re uh, reoccur that in the NFL now. So just every opportunity you got to get, you got to make a make some shake out of it. Absolutely. So before we wrap up, I uh, I want to get a couple fun non football questions in front of you. Let's uh, do it. Yeah, one thing I remember, I think we met briefly a couple of years back when you were at Penn State. Um, we had the mm-hmm. Big Ten bus. You signed it. I think it was like it either said, "Hey, sugar," or "Slide, sugar," something like that. Sugar baby, right? Sugar baby. I, this this works into your nicknames. So like, take me through this. How how does this come about? What, you know, what's what are all the uh, iterations of the nickname? And yeah. is this, do you always sign stuff like that? So, a lot of people. Okay, so the "Hey, sugar" came from literally came from me and my boys just in the like just having fun in the locker room. It was just more so, uh, you know. What do we say? It was more so um, how how would your grandmother, how would your aunt talk to you? You know, like, hey, sugar, hey, hey, pumpkin, stuff like that. So interview day comes, I think it was like a day before picture day. And I remember Lamont Wade from across, from across the way said, what's up, Kate Blizz? And I said, hey, sugar. And they caught it on camera. And so interview asked him, like, what is that? I'm like, oh, no, that's just, that's just, you know, some fun stuff we do. And I kind of stuck with it. Like everybody kept saying, I noticed on campus, you know, I'll hear from, I'll be walking to class and you, you'll hear somebody say, what's up, sugar? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, what's up? Like, you know, it just came like a normal thing. And so that's what like, you know, people start calling me sugar. You know, I call myself sugar baby K. That's like my little nickname for myself. I got a whole bunch of nicknames, but you know, uh, people even call me uh, K Gliz. Um, that's like my rapper name. We used to act like we used to be rappers. So K Gliz is my rapper name. Um, Sugar Baby is just my personal nickname, and then they call me Sugar. So that's like, that's just like my own thing, really. You know, you're never gonna run out of nicknames like that, man. You, you know, you just keep a few in the rotation. I, I gain, I gain more nicknames as I go. Like I, it just comes to me. If they just somebody call me something one day, somebody call me Sugar the next day. You know, it's just they come to me. Love it, love it. Um, also, you know, was scrolling through your social media recently, and and a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago there was this whole like. You had to be there, craze. You know, those are the memes going around. So, kind of getting some nostalgia going with, with uh, people around. You know, close to our age. Um, yep. And you retweeted the one that that said, 
or that was talking about TV shows from, you know, our childhoods, right? So you had like yep. Dexter's Lab, Ed, Ed, and Eddie Ooh. was on there, Codename Kids Next Door, all those Ooh. classics. So if you, yeah, if you could, can you rank your top, you know, maybe three to five cartoons or shows that you liked growing up, whether it was like Nick, Disney, Cartoon Network, any of these shows? Let me tell you, Kids Next Door was number one for me. Always. Because like, I feel like Kids Next Door, I think every kid went to live that lifestyle. You know, fighting adults. You know, they was building building crazy machines and, you know, uh, different type of vehicles and stuff out of, like, bottles and stuff like that. Like, it was pretty cool. So it was like, you always watch that. I think that was always my number one. Um, I think Ed and Eddie had to be number two. Curse the Cowardly Dog. What else? But you know, when I was young, I used to really be like an Elmo and Teletubbies guy. So like that's why like my probably three to four year old stage, that was my thing. Like Elmo and Teletubbies. But um let me see. Johnny Bravo, banger. Uh Powerpuff Girls was a banger. So are those four five or three four? Or does Elmo fit in there? I would have to really sit down and think and like write out the pros and cons of each. Cause them, them is hard. Yeah, I know. Them is hard. I, you know, if you want, we can. Uh, I'll have you send it to us on on IG because we're gonna make a graphic out of this. Get the fans involved. See what they think. I, so I, I agree with all to. these picks. You know, I don't. I don't think I can rank them, but I can for sure give you a ten. I can for sure give you ten good ones. Okay. But I will have the top three. I would rank. But this is. But that's just my opinion, though. Like everybody, everybody got a different opinion. So, yeah, but I'm for sure, kids next door is number one for me. Courage. Courage was a great one. It was so scary, though, you know, especially for little kids. But I, I, I didn't, it. I didn't realize it when I was younger. I didn't realize how scary it was. Like, I thought Powerpuff Girls was scary too. Some of those what? villains were scary. I mean, dude, there was uh, Mojo Jojo was kind of scary. No, he was. It was not. a great, great show though. So I don't think Mojo Jojo was scary at all. I not mean, all. you just might have a better uh, tolerance for fear, you know, as a, as a. As a kid. Yeah, everybody's different. Everybody's different. So. Exactly. You know, that's why we got to get the fans involved and in, in going. So I'll, I'm yeah. going to hold you to that. Um, oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. All right. A couple more to wrap up. Uh, I know your, your, you know, your parents are always very involved. We, we always see uh, them on social media. Um, I saw you got your mom a puppy recently, right? Is this uh, little, little Denver. Yeah. And uh, it was Denver. just, it was national puppy day, I believe yesterday. Um, so, you know, kind of coming full circle here. One, how did you, decide to get your you know your mom and puppy it sounds like you named it denver and also like beyond that how do you now top that gift going forward because i feel like once you give a gift like that like that's it's, it's hard to top that like on mother's day or, her birthday <laughs> or whatever yeah um so it was right after i got drafted my mom's always been talking about she always wanted a puppy so um we haven't had a puppy in a long time and you know i found a person who was giving one away uh denver is a he's a maltese bichon poodle i'm pretty sure um, like me and my family, we never liked big dogs. Like I always like the small little dog. Like I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a complete softy when it comes to puppies. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like I'm a complete softy. So, um, I really was in love with the dog before my mom was. I was the first to hold it and all that stuff. So I got him, and then I had a duffel bag. I had a duffel bag, and me and my girlfriend walked into the door. So I looked like I came from a workout. And I was like, you know, introducing little Denver. And I pulled him out the bag and she automatically just screamed. She's like, whose dog is this? I'm like, it's yours. Um, she was so excited. Um, he's now, he's, he's like 13 pounds. Still not that big, but he's a little big. Um, he's getting on my mom's nerves now, but she still loves him though. He's, he's a little bad. He's a little bad sometimes, but, you know, I love him. He's an adorable dude. Yeah, it's a funny video. We'll have to pull that up and fans yeah. can see what you're talking I, about. I, I, I saw the gym I, bell. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to top that, though. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, you know, NFL players and professional athletes getting their, their parents' gifts, you know, either pets or you can always do the car with the bow on it route, the, you know, the house yeah. maybe. Like, at least you have the, you know, you got yeah. the means to do so if you need to. Well, well yeah, I, I don't think. Well, I did. Okay, another gift. You know, it was more so to help my mom out. It was, um, you know, I paid my mother's student loans off. So I think that was, you know, I think stuff like that is way more of a flex than buying, you know, your mama, you know, $600,000 car, you know what I'm saying? House, like my parents, my parents are good right now. You know, they both work two good jobs. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell them to quit because I know my parents are hard workers. So, um, 
why would you quit if I'm not quitting? You know, I'm not, I'm not this five hundred million dollar man yet. You know, uh, not yet. You know, hopefully one day. Um, but you know, I feel like I needed to do that just because it was more important than, you know, the all the materialistic things. You know, so I think stuff like that is a bigger flex than you know all the materialistic things. That's just my opinion. You know, nothing against people who do that for their parents. You know, you're supposed to do that for your parents, but you know, I feel like some stuff should come first. That's just my opinion, though. KJ, that's the wholesome podcast content we love to hear, man. Paying off your your mom's student loans. That's we love to hear it. Yeah, gotta uh, do that. So wrapping up, uh, you know, one kind of silly question, but I am curious about this. Uh, you know, your GM, John Elway, can he can he still sling it at all? Like, have you talked to him about that? Obviously, being the Hall of Fame quarterback that he is. I actually, I actually seen him throw a ball one time in practice, and I'm like, I don't know if he can sling it like he used to, but it's still a spiral. It's still a clean spiral on that thing. So I don't know. I don't know if he can sling it 70 yards, but he can for sure still throw it. He still got the form and everything. You'll have to get out there sometime, run some routes with him, see if he can hit you. Nah, I don't, I don't think he's going to – nah, because I might outrun his arm. I might outrun his arm. No offense. No offense to Elway, but, you know, I got that speed on me. <laughs> All right, last one. Uh, we mentioned the same high school as A-Rob, Allen Robinson. Mm -hmm. uh, when he was on here, he was talking up Detroit-style pizza. And, you know, I'm, I'm in Chicago. We love our deep dish. I like New York-style pizza. Are you a Detroit style pizza fan? And how does it rank up with like other food that you've experienced now? You know, being in Denver, traveling around the country, yeah. being in Happy Valley, all that. It, it depends. It depends on what he, I've never had Chicago pizza. Now that's one thing I have never had. I've never. I've been to Chicago plenty of times. But I've just never had the pizza. Um, but like my pizza, like I love like I love like Hungry Howie's. You know, Jets pizza. You know. Um, when I was younger, it was Little Caesars, but everybody thinks Little Caesars is nasty. But that hot and ready is something, something crazy. You get the extra cheese, and you, you know, you put the spray the garlic on it, and then add the bacon on it with a little extra parmesan. Oh, yeah. the butter on the rim. Ooh, man, that is mean. <laughs> that is a mean hot and ready right there. So I can't. Um, I have to. I have. I'll have to go to Chicago just to try it though. I gotta put that. In, I gotta put that in my notes. Gotta write that one down. Definitely. But, and you're right, man. Like Little Caesars just slept on. I like it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't know what people are talking about. Cause I, I haven't tasted any pizza up, up Penn State that was better than Detroit pizza. So nah. Nah. All right, I lied. I did have one more question because I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh Trace McSorley, like kind of having a second wind as like a TikTok star. You know, did you hear that song that went viral? Uh on TikTok? Yeah, uh, I think I it's a Trace McSorley song, that's right? It. Yeah, that's it. Who made it? So I think it came out like while he was still in school. But then for some reason with like TikTok going crazy, it got really popular last season. And he was on the Ravens and Trace McSorley basically became like a huge TikTok star off that. And I just think it's funny because he's such like a, he seems like a soft-spoken dude. That's, I've interacted yeah. with him. So. No, nah, um, we see who, that just, that just shows who really got the juice. So it was like, it was out of like, I think it was like, People who were saying that were most like um, exciting to watch was I think it was like me, Trace, and Saquon. So Trace got a song though, so I think he tops it. <laughs> he tops it. He got a song. I don't got no song. <laughs> Not at all. We gotta work on that, KJ. You know, as you're working toward that second contract, work on getting you know you a viral TikTok. Yeah, as well. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work on getting me a song. That'd, that'd be sweet. Yeah, we'll check back in on you <laughs> on that, but. Hey, man, I appreciate you jumping on. Kept you for longer than I thought, but I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, yeah, man, it, it was uh, it was a blast. And uh, going to be rooting for you, not just for selfish reasons because you're on my fantasy team, but, you know, mm -hmm. generally <laughs> as a Big Ten guy. So uh, Yeah, got to put on. Yeah. Got to support. Put on for the Big Ten. We'll, uh, we'll watch you on the Broncos and appreciate you jumping on, man. Um, love to have you anytime. Nah, I appreciate you for having me anytime, anytime. All right, thanks again to KJ for joining me. Best of luck to him as he continues to navigate his NFL career. Definitely rooting for him. Um, and he's one of the most exciting players to watch when he gets in space and has the ball in his hands. So shout out to KJ Hamler. All right, kicking it over now to our regular weekly guest on the Take 10 podcast. It's Harold Shelton, our in-house manager at Research. He is great at basically putting in words what we all see in Big Ten football and basketball and what we saw this past uh, past weekend 
in March Madness was a lot of Big Ten teams going down, and uh, Harold tried to explain some of it and has some interesting ideas and, and theories as to what happened and, and why the Big Ten already has eight of its nine teams sitting at home uh, in the NCAA tournament. When we entered, uh, tournament we entered with such kind of high hopes for the league, and uh, one team now still carrying those hopes on its shoulders in the Michigan Wolverines. So we'll talk about why uh, those teams are at home, why Michigan's still alive and the chances to advance, and uh, some more stuff as well in the discussion. So we'll toss it over now to Harold Shelton. All right, very pleased to be rejoined by Harold Shelton, Big Ten Network Manager of Research. Harold, just going to start off by saying welcome back. Um, we haven't chatted for a few weeks. A lot has happened. But first off, you know, good to have you back on the show. Yeah, always good to be back. Appreciate you having me on. Um, it has been a while, so I know we got a lot to catch up on. Yeah, let's get into it. And, um, you know, before we talk about the NCAA tournament and the Big Ten's disappointing showing uh, to this point, let's get into our guest topic. You know, we started kind of addressing and, and reminiscing on the the guests at the top of the show and your, your memories of how they, uh, you know, impacted you in their careers. So what do you remember about KJ Hamler? What's some of the moments that stick out? Just had a great conversation with him, and he was a lot of fun to talk to, a lot of, a lot of fun uh, talking to and meeting. I remember at Penn State, we were on campus, and he was just as energetic, and, and uh, the NFL has not changed him. So what do you remember about uh, our guy KJ? I remember when he was in high school and the, the thought was that he was going to be wearing green and white. Um, and then the further away he got from high school, once he went down to IMG, um, it looks like, you know, Penn State kind of turned the turn heat up on him and he wound up going there. Uh, obviously worked out great for him. Um, I remember Howard Griffith was very, very high on him ever before, even before he uh, actually took the field, um, you know, called him the human joystick. You could see why. Um, I think the, the biggest games uh, to me were both at home. Uh, the Ohio State game, he goes 93 yards, you know, outruns that entire team. So you, you can see the speed, you can see the explosiveness. Um, you know, anytime he had the ball in his hands, he was a threat to take it to the house. And then the second game was the Michigan game. Um, I believe it was uh, his last year there. Uh, I remember him. You know, streaking down the field, you know, catching a bomb from Sean Clifford, and that wound up being the difference in the game. Um, and I just think Penn State, you know, they've done a really, really good job recently of getting a lot of kids out of Detroit um, and just the, in the surrounding areas, and he was definitely one of those uh, that's part of that pipeline and that continues under James Franklin to this day. Yeah, and I talked about him being from Michigan. I think he's from Pontiac. We talked about him being the same high school as Allen Robinson. So like to your point, you know, they've done a really good job of of going in there and finding those guys. And I'm excited to see how his career develops just because I feel like, you know, with the Kansas City Chiefs and a lot of these offenses in the NFL um, and, you know, the Chiefs showing how you can use a guy like Tyreek Hill just in space and and KJ starting to kind of fit into that mold in Denver a little bit. Uh, The second half of last year, they, they started utilizing him more after he got healthy. Um, you know, excited to see what he can do because they don't teach that speed. No, no, not at all. And, you know, to your point, you know, they're, they're finding more and more ways to, to get guys like that involved. You know, before, you know, if you were a small guy, you know, you wouldn't see the field as much unless it was just gadget stuff. But you can tell he's going to be a big part of your offense going forward. I'm sure it helps to have a teammate in Deshaun Hamilton there too, or at least a, a fellow Penn Stater. Yeah, uh, you know, there as well. And I was happy for him. I know I can't remember <clears throat> I can't remember the opponent, but I remember him catching the game winning touchdown with no time left uh this past Chargers. season. Yeah. yeah, against the Chargers. So uh you could tell that he's gonna be definitely part of their plans. Um, you know, if that offense gets rolling, he'll be a big reason why. Yeah, and uh, it's the same reason like everyone was drooling over uh Rondale Moore and his combine time or his pro day time this past week, and it's kind of that pro day season and um, you know, I, I, I never like to talk about that type of stuff too much. Cause like, it's all just kind of a lot of it's window dressing, right. And, and just time, uh, killing material and all that, but we will talk a little bit about what we're looking for as, as this pro day season, NFL draft season cranks up, uh, at the end of the, the segment here. But first I do want to dive into some, uh, big 10 basketball talk with you. 
it's what we've been doing the last, you know, three, four months on the show. Uh, that's why you're here. So, H, let's just start broad. Like, what happened, man? Why do you think eight of the nine Big Ten teams are already eliminated? Sweet 16 only features Michigan. Uh, the Big Ten's number one seed, Illinois, is gone. Ohio State had the big upset. Purdue was upset by North Texas. Um, are, are there any grand takeaways, or is this just, just kind of a fluky matchup year where it all kind of spiraled down? Um, if I had a dollar for every time I got that question over the last few days, um, I could probably retire early. Like it's your fault. Everyone's like, hey, what happened? <laughs> exactly. Like, Big Ten, what the heck? Like, I got a lot of those. Uh, you know, texts and emails and, and tweets over the last few days. Um, I think it was more of an outlier than anything else. Um, I'm not just going to say everything was completely fluky, uh, but you know, I, I think Michigan State kind of set the tone that Thursday, 14-point uh, lead, five-point lead with a minute 10 left, late game execution, very poor, wind up losing in overtime. Uh, Ohio State carried over to, to Ohio State. You know, they had a four point lead late, bad late game execution, lost in overtime. Uh, Purdue against North Texas were kind of fighting uphill the whole game. Got a lot of and ones late, missed free throws, lost in overtime because of late game execution. Um, even though Rutgers wound up beating Clemson, they had a you know, nine point lead against Houston, missed a dunk. Didn't box out on a free throw, bad turnovers, late game execution, wind up blowing the lead to Houston. So all of these teams were in position to win the games, but for whatever reason, they just didn't close the deal. And I think a lot of it is because in years past, there were always point guards on the team that could, you know, make sure you got the right play, you know, whether it's getting in the lane, getting a foul or you know, coming up with a clutch jumper, you know, we, we saw that with our best teams. It's usually uh, an elite point guard that finds a way to make a play. Um, I think the best point guard in our league was not an NCAA tournament this year, Marcus Carr. I, I don't consider Iowa a point guard, just me personally, so I'm not counting him in the conversation. But I think our best point guard um, as a conference that was in an NCAA tournament was Dimitri Trice. Um, and that's no shade to Dimitri Trice. Um, I think he's a really good player, but if he's your best point guard representing a conference, I think it just shows that it's not as strong of a position as it has been in the past. And I think a lot of the losses that occurred was, were because teams had a hard time uh, getting offense that they wanted to get. The one variable, right, that we can obviously point to that – has never happened before. Hopefully it'll never happen again is that everybody had to in the big 10 stay in Indy for of course in multiple weeks, stay in hotel rooms. Um, I don't know if there's anything to that. I just bring it up because like I said, that that's the only, that's the, you know, direct correlation that, that one could, one could assume just with the performance looking so sluggish, so flat across the board almost, um, you know, athletic, the big 10, I think was outmatched athletically in some of these matchups and schematically, but I don't think that accounts for the, you know, all the sluggishness that we saw. Like, Iowa could not, you know, keep their feet against Oregon. Oregon completely control, you know, switched their pace. Oregon is a slow-playing basketball team on offense, and they sped Iowa up, which is crazy. Um, you know, Illinois is more athletic than Loyola, but Loyola ground them into dust with their scheme. Do you think that just the long layover in Indy had anything to do with it, or is that just a convenient ex excuse? Um, I think it's more of an excuse than anything, but this is for, this is an outsider looking in. Like I, I'm not in those locker rooms, those meeting rooms. You know, I don't know how it feels to just be in one place for two weeks and, you know, trying to figure out everything during COVID where you can't go do this or that, like your ideas. I will you know, say I was there for one and it was, it was mentally like just kind of a drain, not in a bad way for me, but like it does get, um, repetitive for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, maybe, you know, I did hear a couple people refer to it as like indiitis, like maybe or something to that. Um, but, you know, Michigan still figured it out, still found a way uh, to get through. Uh, I think also part of it too is, uh, so some of it's bad matchups. And a lot of, a lot of times in a tournament, it's a bad matchup. 
Um, I think Illinois, you know, they were the third number one seed. They probably shouldn't have, you know, played a seeded Loyola uh, in the second round. Um, I thought they probably were a six. Now, granted, you're a one seed. You're supposed to, to win that game. Um, and I was surprised at, you know, how Loyola pretty much controlled it throughout. But that's a matchup that probably shouldn't have happened in the second round. Um, the fact that the Pac-12 regular season champion was a seven seed, you know, facing Iowa in the second round, um, I thought that was were just, you know, two bad matchups. But at the same time, both of those teams weren't really close to winning those games. And so I think part of the reason is because uh, you might think uh, Dana Altman and Porter Moser had great game plans and kind of took those teams out of what they wanted to do. Uh, in the case of Iowa, the the point guard play, I mean, Jordan Bohannon, you know, didn't really do much and couldn't keep those guys out of the lane. And, you know, I think us uh, seeing pretty much, I think everybody in the Big Ten plays the same style outside of Maryland. It's a big dominated league this year. You know, you don't really have to worry about guards getting in the lane and what happens from there. Maryland's the only one that kind of plays small, goes five out and, you know, drive and get to the line. And if you just kind of see the same thing over and over again, especially with the lack of non-conference games we had this year because of COVID, you kind of get into a repetitive, you know, motion over and over again. And then you see something else and it's like, whoa, I'm not used to this. And, and, and it might take a while to get used to it. And at that point, you're fighting a bill and it might be too late. Yeah, I said this yesterday to somebody um, when they asked me kind of the same question that, you know, maybe there isn't a, a great explanation. Just because the rhythm, I think, that a lot of Big Ten teams were in going into the NCAA tournament was so good, right? Like, Iowa had kind of refound their their stride. They were playing better defense. Illinois looked you know, mostly unbeatable until that Ohio State game. Um, Ohio State had, had looked like they'd regained some of that composure, you know, getting to the, the final, winning three games in Indy. And then... It, like I just take the Illinois game because that was the one I was most invested in, and it was just a complete, completely devoid of any you know explanation. Like how could those guys go out like that? You know, how could they not make adjustments and and be unprepared for what Loyola was throwing at them? And like you said, maybe it is just one of those years where it, it's mostly an outlier, right? Like it's just kind of devoid of explanation, and there's not really some sort of uh, solace we can lean into and and explain it. Um, but I do like you know some of those possible explanations that, that you offered. I, I agree with all of them. I do think, like you said, the 20 games, 24 games for, for some teams, seeing the same type of styles, uh, having games called a certain way can potentially be an issue. And then we've talked about it over the years, right? Like this has always kind of haunted the Big Ten when it comes to finally reaching the mountaintop, like the lack of lottery picks, overall athleticism. Um, it's just a reality, right? Like the the, the talent is always, it is, is never going to be, um, in the Big Ten's favor when it comes to NBA talent, uh, except for, you know, very specific circumstances. So do you think that played into it at all? Like, that doesn't really explain to me why only one team would make the Sweet 16, just because, like, we've never had trouble getting to the Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Final Four, even the National Championship. It's always just that final, you know, summit. But uh, I don't know if that jumped out at you uh, just with, with the talent. Because, like, we saw, you know, other teams struggle too. Kate Cunningham's out of the tournament too. Um, it, it's It's not like there's athleticism across the board but then when you look at like Oregon and Houston and guys that are really long and athletic and and play up tempo um I don't know it's just another potential reason for what we saw yeah I think there's something to that once you get to why they haven't won a title um I don't know if it really pertains to this year um you know a lot of the teams that produce a lot of the talent you know didn't even make the tournament or didn't even win a game you know, in the, the Kentuckys, the Dukes, you know, Kansas went out, lost by 34 in the second round. You know, these are the teams that normally produce, you know, a lot of NBA guys. I just think it's just one of those years, just a yeah. just an odd year. Um, you know, upsets happen. We got the craziest Sweet 16 statistically ever. Um, you know, you got a 15 seed in the Sweet 16. Um it's possible Loyola could be, I know they're not the highest seed in that region, but I think a lot of people might have Loyola as the favorite of that region as an eight seed. Um, yeah. And so just kind of goes to show, you know, I think it's just that kind of year. 
Uh, I do think the the lack of high end talent um, certainly plays a part as to why the drought has continued in terms of a national champion. But I don't think it had anything to do with why the Big Ten underperformed in the tournament this year. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I agree. More style than um, actual, you know, lottery pick talent. I, like you said, a lot of those teams aren't even aren't even in it. Um, and we're talking like it's all over. Like it's not. Michigan still is in it. They, um, you know, have have an interesting game coming up against Florida State. They beat one of those super athletic teams in LSU. How do you like Michigan's chances to uh, make another Final Four? It's four straight Sweet 16s for them. That's just absolutely incredible, especially when you see how hard it is. Uh, this year has shown that more than more than any. Um, so what have you liked about Michigan's run so far? They've responded nicely without livers. And do you think they have the juice to make it to uh, their second Final Four now in three seasons? Yeah, it's funny. I think that they probably are, are stuck in the toughest region left. Um, but, you know, major, major kudos to them. Well, LSU punched them in the mouth hard early. And you kind of wondered, and, and this was right after Iowa had lost, and you're like, okay, is, is everybody going home? You know, like, are we not even going to get a team to the second weekend? And, you know, they showed a lot of moxie. You know, being old can win, as we saw. You know, guys like Eli Brooks stepped up big. Shawnee Brown stepped up big. He kind of tilted the balance in Michigan's favor once he got on the court. Um, and I thought Jawan Howard did a really good job of adjustments. You know, they were they were in man for a while. They switched it up, went zone, you know, kind of went back and forth, you know, schematically with some different things. And, you know, once the defense got locked in, forced LSU to take a bunch of tough shots, Michigan was able to take advantage of that. Um, so, you know, I think they should be able to beat Florida State. I know Florida State um, is definitely a, a, a tough team, you know, very athletic, very long. Um, but I think they have a lot of the same issues that LSU does in terms of uh, shot selection and, and things of that sort. So I think Michigan could play a smarter game and beat them. Um, before the tournament, I had Alabama in the Final Four coming out of that region. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if that happened again, but I do think Michigan at least wins one more. Dude, Alabama, what they did to Maryland was was nuts. I, I've seen them play a few times this year, and I always wonder what teams like that – like. Why, what, uh, why do they get hot sometimes? You know, what, what really makes them turn it on in situations like that? That second half against Maryland uh, was an absolute, you know, scorched earth session right there. So what, why do you think, you know, teams can employ that strategy sometimes and have it really work? It, it's fascinating to watch them literally only take layups and threes. Um, like they did not ex attempt any mid-range jumpers from what I saw. Uh, and, you know, why do you think that works? And is it something that you think is worth – more teams adopting you know it's it's weird that alabama they've become strictly a uh analytics team like you said it's it's all threes it's all layups um you know very little mid-range uh but at the same time they're still third nationally in defense so it's not like they're just a gimmick only trying to outscore you if they don't get what they want they could still find a way to get back in the game defensively too um, I'm a big fan of Nate Oates as a coach. Um, he's, you know, he basically cut his teeth as a coach in Michigan in high school, uh, you know, coaching Romulus before getting the call up to Buffalo and then, you know, to Alabama. Um, we haven't really seen a team play this style before, you know, in, in college and actually get to the mountaintop. So I'm very curious to see uh, if they do that. But, you know, I think that, they're a smarter team than LSU. I think that they're a little bit more versatile. You know, they've got length everywhere and they shoot a ton of threes, so they'll never be out of any game. I'll be very curious to see if they can actually get there because you always wonder, like Michigan has guys who have, you know, played in bigger moments. You could tell Alabama was extremely nervous in that Iona game. They just kind of, once they finally got over that hump, they were able to play a lot looser. I'd be curious to see if those two meet up in the Elite Eight. Will, you know, Michigan kind of program experience, big games, will that kind of come out and decide it late? Yeah, I mean, two scary teams for sure that uh, are looming for them. But, I mean, th th this program has proven it. Like, it's it's a made-for-March type of program. It's on one of those, you know, type of roles now, it looks like. Um, and you just feel bad that Livers can't be a part of it. But, uh it, it, Honestly, I've not heard an update, but do they expect him 
Is there a chance he could come back or um, is he pretty much done? Um, talking to people that like follow the program, that kind of stuff, they don't think he's coming back, even though Livers apparently has said all the stuff he's supposed to say about how, you know, he's trying really hard to get back. But I think it would be a surprise if he is. Again, I, I don't know anything for sure. I'm just kind of basing it off of people that I talk to. But um, I do think ha not having him certainly hurts from a depth point of view. You know, the fact that Shawnee Brown is able to come in and provide major minutes is great. It's just that if he isn't, then who do you rely on? You know, before, you know, if Brown, Brown could be kind of a wild card. It's, you know, okay, you know, he's playing great, so we'll leave him on the court. If he's just playing okay, then, you know, maybe we go back to Livers a little bit more or Wagner a little bit more. Now they don't have that depth where if – he's having a bad game or Wagner's having a bad game. They don't have another guy to kind of step in and fill that void. And so I think that's where he's uh, livers has probably missed more than anything else. In addition to just him being a really good player. Yeah. He was not moving well, like in the immediate aftermath of that injury in Indy. Um, so I just kind of assumed, I guess, but we can uh, talk more about Michigan for sure in the coming, you know, next week or two, if they indeed do advance. So it should be, uh, you know, definitely be fun. Always fun to have a Big Ten team in the Final Four. We got a streak to maintain here. Uh, two years, two March Madnesses in a row. So, and they're always from the state of Michigan somehow. Funny how that works. Um, yeah, it seems like those two outside of uh, a couple years of Wisconsin, those two have been kind of carrying the flag here for a little while. So uh, we'll see if Michigan takes it back from Michigan State. Yep. All right, H, before we wrap up, um, what is now on your plate? Like one team remaining, so that, that load has definitely been lightened. Uh, what are we doing now in the spring? I know we got pro day stuff on. I see Penn State's doing theirs right now. Uh, it's actually interesting. Like I did not really anticipate how much the focus would tilt uh, with no indie combine. Like all eyes are really now on these, these pro days and – People are like just scrambling for any type of clip or footage they can get and number, you know, unofficial 40 time number they can get out of these places. So like we saw Rondale Moore, I mentioned him uh, the other day, uh, Josh and Matter Bebe last week had some crazy numbers. Um, and then now uh, Awe and Michael Parsons are kind of the two big guys from Penn State. So like what's what's coming up for you? Um, like I said, I try not to get too deep into this, uh, you, you know, combine little subculture but uh it's definitely news and and spring football is coming up too so like what's going on with you man um so i know we only got one team left on the men's side but we got four left on the women's side and so sure. you know we're we're still gonna be you know full board following the ladies uh shout out to them that's the first time big tens ever had four teams in the sweet 16 on the women's side so um it's funny, you know, I think a lot of people kind of talked about, you know, where some of the men's teams overseeded. I think a lot of the women's teams were underseeded and, you know, they're, they're flexing their muscles. And so they're, they're, they're putting on for the league. Um, and that's good to see. So we'll be following them throughout. I think Maryland's got a chance to get to the final four. So that'll keep me busy if that does happen. Um, other than that spring football, like you said, you know, we didn't have it last year, you know, at this point, everything was shut down. You know, normally there was, you know, we, there's normally like spring football games on the network and all that stuff. Don't know if we're going to get uh, as many as we have in the past, but I wouldn't be shocked if we, you know, have some spring football on TV that we cover. Um, you know, after the combine, we'll do some stuff with NFL draft, like uh, from the digital standpoint, I'll probably help out there just in terms of, you know, what guys are going to get drafted and like having notes ready for whenever that does happen. Uh, but yeah, other than that, you know, we get, in the baseball, soccer, lacrosse, everything's kind of coming together at once, which is rare. And, you know, some of these uh, winter sports and fall sports got moved to the spring. So the spring schedule's a little, little longer, a little meatier than it normally is. Um, but it, we'll, we'll, we'll still, you know, keep track of that. Um, it's just not as labor intensive as football and basketball, but I'll still, I'll still be pretty busy. Yeah, we'll have to figure out some uh, topics to dive into. I know we kind of like did some, uh, uh, you know, like immediate aftermath of the shutdown last spring when we kind of had some topics, but I feel like we can get into some more in the next uh, few weeks as we do more episodes and just, you know, classic banter about, you know, favorite teams of all time and, and uh, things like that, look backs and maybe uh, some look aheads as well, just with some exciting recruits coming in, um, you know, football, basketball. I know people like to hear about that, so. 
we'll figure out some stuff to, to touch on going forward. Um, besides that, H, uh, we got to, you know, get these get these vaccines going so we can get on the bus tour this summer. Um, already got I'm, mine. There got you mine go. last week. Johnson and Johnson, one and done. I'm ready. Oh, to one go. and done. Wow. I wish I could do that. I'm I'm coming up this weekend, so I finally was able to. I like crowdsourced it. Like I was complaining about how difficult it was to uh, get one. You know, jokingly uh, in the city, uh, tweeted about it. So uh, somebody actually, you know, sent me a link that ended up working. So oh, you're good. good to go. And I don't know, like if the the bus tour is on the docket. It seems like the most. You know, uh, it seems like a very uh, if you were to propose it last summer, a very COVID unfriendly thing to do. But like, if you know, the world is a different place in the uh, late summer, then my fingers are crossed. I, it seems like that would be like the ultimate signal of a return to almost normal. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I was asking a couple of people, like you know, especially my wife. I'm like, I wonder if there's going to be a bus tour this year. And she's like, Yeah, that'd be really interesting if it was. And you know, cause, you know that's three weeks. We're gone. You know, and bunch of people uh, in close quarters. Yeah, bunch of people in close quarters, uh, especially in the back of the bus and stuff like that uh, for hours on end, I think would certainly be interesting. Obviously, no chance of that happening a year ago, but, you know, from late March to early August, you know, a lot of a lot of things can happen. And so, you know, I'll be very curious to see um, if we do do that. I do think it kind of sets the tone going into the fall. You kind of get a better idea of, of the teams and, you know, I know just personally, I was kind of at a disadvantage because I didn't know, like, okay, who's going to start for sure. Like, you're not there to see, like, okay, who's running with the ones, who's running with the twos. Uh, you know, some of the new guys, like, okay, this guy's definitely going to play. Okay, this guy might red shirt. Like, we didn't have any of that. We were just kind of going in blind. Um, and so I do think the tour, if we wound up having it, could be very beneficial. And it'd be fun. You know, we, we always have a good time on that bus. For sure. Fingers crossed, um, and you know, hopefully, the schools let us back in after closing the door. You know, it's it's, it's easy to close down, hard to open back up sometimes. But uh, fingers crossed for all that. Um, H, that's all I got for you this week. Hopefully, we get back with you soon here. Um, not as long as a hiatus coming up as we've had. This thing's really busy in the last month or so. But um, talk to you soon, and uh, we'll see how long Michigan can stay alive, and then our our four ladies teams as well. Yeah, sounds good, man. We'll see uh, See what happens going forward. And let's see if the Big Ten can keep this going and these kind of salvage stuff. All right. Talk soon. All right. Thanks again to Harold, KJ, for joining the show. Really fun as always. And we'll be uh, increasing the frequency of these episodes. You know, if you listen regularly, uh, we haven't been doing as many as often uh, just because of the uh, hectic schedule we've had in the last few weeks with March Madness and the Big Ten Tournament in Indianapolis. Um, but we will be doing these more frequently now as things have slowed down, as we uh, you know continue to get deeper into spring here. And, uh, you know, always a great time of year to talk to football players like KJ. A lot of those guys are just kind of waiting for the season to start. And um, it's, a, it's a good time to ramp up those NFL and football storylines with the pro day and draft like we talked with Harold about. So expect more football talk coming up, uh, more NFL players, more recent Big Ten alums as they get ready for the NFL draft. We'll have all kinds of guests coming up. So definitely keep it locked here. And you can follow along, subscribe on the Big Ten Network's YouTube channel. Uh, these interviews all are on YouTube, like especially for an interview like KJ. He was He's somebody who uh, I think the interviews are made a lot better by seeing it. He's, he's just kind of really uh, hilarious and was kind of gesturing and dancing at times. And, um, you know, we we love doing these over Zoom because of that personality that's able to shine through. So um, definitely check it out on YouTube if you haven't already. There's a Tech 10 podcast playlist there. And then the audio version of the podcast can be found on uh, your traditional podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Play. I think it's called Google Podcast now, uh, their, their platform. And then Spotify, Podbean, places like that. So definitely subscribe, leave a rating and review if you have not already. All right. Thanks as always to Julie Bronder for editing the show. Thanks as always to everyone who has tuned in. And we'll talk to you soon here on the Take 10 Podcast.